Everyone here is wearing clothes. At least, I hope you are. It'd be really strange if you weren't. But back to the clothes. When you picked out what to wear today, you made a choice. That choice was probably governed by metrics like what was clean or what you were doing today. For some of us, that metric was what would make us seem more cool or fashionable. Lifestyle magazine The Vogue describes 2021's trends as Y2K fashion, academia, and hot goth. With the internet's presence in our lives, we've gotten access to more trends, and we're getting them faster. With these trends, it's really easy for us to say that what's fashionable today is different from what was fashionable 100 years ago. It's probably more difficult for us to identify what's similar between these periods. Just because the looks themselves are different, though, doesn't mean that their trends don't follow similar principles. Trends aren't something that magically pop into existence. We create them to reflect who we are, for better or for worse. First, we will explore the trends of Victorian England, and then we'll move into the mid to late 20th century. Finally, we'll discuss fast fashion in the modern industry. To the untrained eye, Victorian fashion all looks the same, but Queen Victoria ruled for 67 years, and trust me, not all Victorian decades were created equal. From the 1860s to the 1890s, Britain and its fashion trends saw significant change. Under Queen Victoria's rule, the British Empire became the first global industrial power. You could find people producing the world's coal, iron, steel, chemicals, and textiles. Sewing machines became more common and they became more efficient. Aside from technology, the Victorian era also saw the progression of socialism, liberalism, and organized feminism. Accordingly, each decade of the Victorian era had different styles. These differences are most notable in the silhouettes of the dresses. As technology developed, textiles and clothing could be created faster and cheaper, making it easier to create these elaborate garments. It wasn't just Victorian outerwear that had trends, though. Believe it or not, so did Victorian underwear. Amelia Jenks Bloomer was an American feminist who published articles in The Lily in support of Bloomers. She said, letters came pouring in upon me by the hundreds from women all over the country, making inquiries about the dress and asking for patterns, showing how ready and anxious women were to throw off the burden of long, heavy skirts. The interest in less restrictive garments is indicative of the impact feminism had on clothing. The inverse is also true. By wearing bloomers, feminists had a physical manifestation of their message. Each decade of the Victorian era had different trends that went in and out of popularity. Each trend was related to the developing technology that allowed its creation. As society and its values change, we can see those beliefs reflected in the new and innovative fashions of each decade. Society may have been very different in the Victorian era, but these themes are also recognizable in more recent history. By the 1960s, London had recovered from World War II and transformed into a city of freedom and possibility. Feminism gained popularity. The birth control pill was legalized, and women argued for equal pay. They began to hope for more than just motherhood and marriage. While Paris fashion houses had been gradually designing shorter and shorter hemlines, Mary Quant is credited with the invention of the miniskirt. Older generations, as expected, saw the miniskirt as scandalous. Ugh, some things never change. However, it stood as a symbol for London's youthful look and women's liberation. Okay, remember when I talked about bloomers earlier? All of that logic also applies here. Feminism freed women to wear more unconventional clothing, and this unconventional clothing was something that turned heads, drawing attention to the meaning behind it. While the miniskirt was a new item in the 60s, designers in the 70s looked towards older styles for inspiration. The 70s represented an incredibly interesting fusion between counterculture, which is culture with different values and norms in general society, and the mainstream. It speaks perfectly to the phenomena of a trend becoming too popular. Counterculture may have initially begun as a contradiction of popular ideas, but by becoming a trend, it became its own worst enemy. Things that previously represented political or social values become nothing more 
than a fashion accessory. In the 1980s, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher introduced policy and legislation that divided the British population. As the week puts it, Thatcher's decade in power emboldened us, corporatized us, and divided us. She left as many poor and bitter as she did wealthy and self-satisfied, and neither group would forget it. Not only did Thatcher lead an era of change, but her position in office also influenced the power dressing of the 80s. Power dressing was a style used by women in male-dominated professional environments to be taken seriously. It's yet another way to draw attention to a message via clothing. Power dressing worked, so people did it, making it a trend. And because people were doing it, it worked. Power dressing works so well that it continues today. Change didn't stop after Thatcher left office. In the 90s, the fight for equality continued as more people immigrated to Britain in search of a better life. Around the world, people gained access to faster-paced communication as technology continued to develop. Thus, popular styles changed far more quickly in the 90s. Rather than having a single trend for each decade, there were often multiple, each with its own influences. This paved the way for the state of today's fashion industry. Today's fashion includes a resurgence of styles seen in the early 2000s. While the looks may be similar, the continued and meteoric rise of fast fashion over the past 20 years has influenced the way we consume clothing. Y2K fashion originated as a response to the minimalism of the mid-1990s. The country was coming out of a recession from the early 90s, and employment rates and wage were on the rise. Y2K is maximalism. And what better way to embody that than having a ton of stuff? The return of Y2K fashion is a response to the recession caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Y2K fashion's modern counterpart suffers from the same issues the original version did. Fast fashion. And it's only gotten worse. Fast fashion describes designs that move quickly from the catwalk to stores. From 2000 to 2015, clothing sales doubled, but the usage of each item went down. Brands like Shein and Forever 21 can come up with 52 micro-seasons a year. In other words, new collections are being released every week. Influencers will often buy hundreds of dollars worth of clothing for a single haul, only to never wear any of these items again. Unlike in previous eras, we get constant access to these trends via social media, which drives consumerism. Further, the clothes that we purchase are often poorly made and cheaply produced, not to mention the incredibly harmful environmental and ethical impacts fast fashion has. Companies will often release toxic chemicals into the environment around their factories, poisoning water and crops, leaving communities without these basic needs. Also, synthetic fibers, which are the most popular fiber on the market right now, are just plastic, which means that with every wash, microplastics are being shed into our wastewater, where they can make out to ecosystems and harm the organisms living in them. Ethical impacts include, but are not limited to, harmful work environments, unlivable wages, and even slave labor. These practices drive down prices, which increases our need to consume. The capitalism machine behind the fashion industry has polluted the permanence of our clothing, making our clothes disposable in a way that they previously weren't. Ultimately, we can find that we, as people, change what we wore to match the changing times. Designers design eras, and our clothes reflect what they've outlined. Thankfully, we aren't entirely at the whim of Persian fashion houses. As consumers, we get a say in fashion trends based on what we buy. If we spend differently on our clothing, we can make waves in the industry that could change the way it's shaped. We might not put too much thought into what we wear each day, but we are participating in the trends orchestrated by the world around us. In that way, fashion isn't its own entity or ideology. It's a mirror of the globalized society in which we live. Thank you.